Hey folks, thanks for joining us today. My name is Guy. And I'm Matt. And this is How to Listen To. Hello and welcome to episode one of How to Listen To. Each episode we'll pick an artist or a band we think is interesting or that we might want to learn a bit more about. We'll have a chat, we'll share a joke, maybe sing a song. Uh, Today we're kicking things off with probably the first band I was ever seriously into as a kid. Matt, who are we listening to today? We are listening to Nirvana. An interesting choice. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Um, As I say, they're probably the first band I was ever really into when I was sort of, I don't know, 11 or 12. They were sort of uh, all over MTV all the time. And Mm. being as I did nothing but watch WWF wrestling and watch uh, MTV as a kid, (laughs) quite a combination, Um, I had a lot of Nirvana in my life. Is that your experience? Um, Not the wrestling, the Nirvana? I I did quite like wrestling, to be honest. Who was your favourite? Um... Oh, what were the names? What were the names? I quite like the one, two, three kid. <laughs> <laughs> he came in. He he he, he beat, um, beat Razor Razor Rudder. Yes, Razor, Razor, Razor Rudder. Get, get the names right. Being a, you said you were a fan. <laughs> you stopped being a footballer. <laughs> Razor Ramon, I think it was. Oh, Razor He's Ramon. Oozing machismo. Oh. Um, yeah, Razor Rudder. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, back to Nirvana. We're already off track here. They uh, hailed from Seattle, Washington. When I was doing my research on Wikipedia, it said they were from Aberdeen, and I briefly thought, <laughs> oh my god, were they Scottish? <laughs> Smells like teen spirits. <laughs> it's their big hit. But no, it was in a place called Aberdeen in Seattle. Um, yeah, wh- when did you first become aware of them? I was probably about 12, the same as you. Um, and I remember um, the first CD that I ever bought, I sent, I don't think I was old enough to go to. Uh, to Worthing Town Centre on my own, so I gave my it's a dangerous bro- place. It is. I gave my brother my pocket money, and it probably would have been about seven pound fifty. Not my pocket money, but all my pocket money and my life savings at the same time <laughs> yeah. um, was about seven pound fifty. Wow. And I gave it to my older brother, um, and I said, "Can you buy me a Nirvana CD?" And he bought me one. Uh, well, I bought it, but he he, he actually he bought, it. he bought it for me. Or probably stole it, to be honest. Was it? Um, was it never mind? No. Oh. It was bleach. You're joking. Yeah. That was your first one. Yeah, yeah. um, that's that's a lot of credibility. Yeah. I mean, it was a, a, a couple of years after um, uh, it came out. It was probably uh, it was after Nevermind came out because I was probably only nine. Did you already have Nevermind? No. Wow. It, that was, is... it was my first ever CD. That's amazing. That is that's a lot of street cred. Do you want to know what my first ever? It's not a CD because I didn't get a CD player till I was quite old. My first ever purchase was What's that? Liberian Girl by Michael Jackson. <laughs> He was wearing a yellow shirt. MJ, on the cover. MJ. Yeah. yeah. I liked it. I, yeah. I bought tapes before. Yeah. Like the bootleg tapes. And I used to send my dad off to. Well, I didn't send him off to work because he, he had to work. <laughs> <laughs> but when, he really ruled the yeah, roost. Like, go to work, dad! <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> um, no, um, he used to go to London quite a bit, and there used no, to be not, this. Not heard of it. London, <laughs> London. I, I think I think I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> London, yeah, um, and um, he um, he he used to go to this little dodgy man. I think it was outside London Bridge with his bootleg tapes. Right. And I got salt and pepper. Ooh, <laughs> I'll push, push it. it. Yeah, yeah exactly. I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you still got it. Oh uh, yeah. Um, but that's not Nirvana, is it? <laughs> no. But I'm impressed that Bleach was your first Nirvana record. Yeah, so I think, am I. I think um, Nevermind was most people's entry point. Ah, never mind. I didn't get Bleach till about 10 years later. But I did get Nevermind on a cassette from our price in, uh, in Worthing. You used to work Sussex. there. I did. Uh, staff discount? Years later. <laughs> no, they didn't give me a staff discount when I was 12. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, you reminded me actually of a, of a tale of someone we kind of grew up with, who I'm not going to name on on tape. We we knew him separately. Who, um, you know, when you're a teenager and you're trying to gain a kind of credibility for you were into a band first and oh, all this yes. sort of stuff. He told us once at, at college that he bought Bleach the day it came out, which uh, someone quickly worked out meant he bought Bleach <laughs> when he was seven years old. It seems slightly unlikely, but especially being as it was released on an independent label called Sub Pop, which mm. presumably was only available kind of in the States. But he, he was there yeah. the day it came out. Yeah, he seven. did, yes. He was at the counter of <laughs> our got, price. <laughs> got the day off school. He uh, did, yes. Um, and he was probably wearing a shell suit. I hope so. I hope mm. so. So Bleach came out in 89 um, mm. with Chad Channing on drums with yeah. Kirk Bain and Chris Novoselic. 
Now, being the drummer for Nirvana in the early days, a bit like being the drummer for Spinal Tap, they went through about 10 of them, didn't they? Um, yeah, there was loads. There's also um, a, a second guitarist on the album as well. Tell me. Called Jason uh, Everman. Jason Everman. Ever- but... See, like rhythm? Yeah, I assume so. Yeah. Um, true Nirvana fans can correct me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on well, any facts that come out. Obviously, we've had but, to have done some research. But I was, I was again listening to it um, this morning, um, and I obviously listen to it all the time. Um, but... I can't really hear the second guitar in most of the most of the tracks. Um, it might be because I'm a bit deaf when it comes to trying to pinpoint certain things. Love Buzz, track five on it, you can hear um, right. a, a second guitar. We should say, uh, Matt, you are a, uh, uh, or storied rather, a uh, rhythm guitarist. Played in bands playing rhythm guitar, haven't you? I, I have played in... <laughs> a band and we had a residency in the Green Mango in Worthing. Yeah. And we played beer. Yeah didn't affect your performance though did it but... well the beer no because yeah. i was always the driver because i was the only one that could drive <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so i was the boring li- uh, rhythm guitarist who was driving yeah <laughs> rock and roll's not dead yeah exactly um so bleach comes out when uh kurt cobain is 22 years old in preparation for this i was listening to all the nirvana records again also there's only three studio albums and my recollection before we did this is that bleach was sort of my least favorite it was a bit scuzzy, yeah. a bit sort of um, raw. And actually, listening to it again, it's kind of the one I've been listening to most. I think I like it best out of all yeah. of them. Because it is a bit scuzzy and raw, but the songs are really strong on it as well. Yeah. And it's it's a really like, it's a hard rock record, isn't it? It's, exactly. And it, it does exactly what you expect it to do. As you said, it's raw. It, it only costs $600 to make. Do you know that? I, I, I do know that. I know you knew that. Yeah. <laughs> But did you know it? <laughs> 40,000 copies sold, which actually, you read that and as in people saying, oh, look, it only sold 40,000 copies and then the follow-up sold, you know, X. But actually 40,000 copies for a debut record, that seems pretty good to me. Like, I don't think mm. I don't think bands these days sell many records at all, obviously, but 40,000 copies, it obviously got the attention of a lot of, um, a lot of producers and stuff and they ended up signing for a major label. Mm. Um, now, I've got to say, when I was listening to it... Uh, I was listening to it and I thought this is really cool. I was listening to it while I was driving to work. And then the track Negative Creep came on. And I texted you actually, didn't I just say Negative Creep? Because fuck me, that's a good <laughs> song. It's so it's I think so that's powerful. what the text said as well. I blushed when it came through. Yeah. It's just um absolutely awesome. Really yeah. powerful, really, really heavy sounding. And it doesn't sound the whole album doesn't sound quite as clean or produced as Nevermind. And that's that's what I really like about it, is the fact that it is it is raw. It but as, as we just spoke about before we were recording, there's also some really decent melodies. What I love about music, and this is a bit contradictory because I like um, quite a collectic taste, but is when it's simplistic. So simplistic, it, it, it makes sense and I can understand it, but it sounds bloody good. Yeah. And one, one of the tracks on, on this, um, Floyd the Barber, I'm... Probably never going to get my hair cut um, by Floyd, I'll be honest, <laughs> if he is a real barber. Um, but the ending of that, and who, who anybody who knows the song will, will know it. Yeah. Uh, it just the guitar um, drops off and the bass drops off, then it's just the drums drop off. It's, and it's only for about five seconds, ten seconds, but it's just, I, I think it, it's beautiful. Yeah. In a sort of unbeautiful no, kind of way about being simplistic and I think Nirvana is sometimes categorised as being uh, the main proponents of the quiet loud quiet sort of um, style of making songs and you certainly hear that on Nevermind they've got a lot of you know uh, quiet verses really loud choruses and stuff but yeah you, you can listen to Bleach and you can tell straight away actually um, that Kurt Cobain's sort of more poppy kind of songwriting that comes mm. through on Nevermind is there it's just produced in a sort of different way yeah. What's your favourite song on Bleach then? Uh, Negative Creep. Yeah. Yeah, I, honestly, I was driving along listening to that and unconsciously started speeding <laughs> <laughs> and sort of uh, kind of tapping my toes and we, fist pumping. We don't and, condone speeding. No, absolutely, we don't. But yeah. <laughs> Only when listening to Negative <laughs> yeah, Creep. <laughs> I don't think that's going to stand up in court. No. Um, but yeah, it was it was amazing. What, what's your favourite track on that? Um, 
that is a a question. I love love buzz. I yeah. just think it's just it's, it's a wicked. Track, it's just cool. It? It's just yeah. cool. I was listening to it coming over here, and it's because met- when you arrived, all I could hear was uh, Celine Dion. <laughs> 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 I was going to do my Celine Dion impression then. Let's save that for when we do Celine Dion episode. But I, I recently did a Louis Armstrong impression and um, I got told off for it. Yeah, That's resist. The... <laughs> exactly. There's no need to black up when you do that impression. <laughs> I'll lose my job. <laughs> As a Louis Armstrong impersonator. <laughs> I'm that <laughs> um, I'm not doing it. No. Although I did once... Uh, ride a camel called uh, Satchmo. Really? Yeah. And also, another camel related um, anecdote um, as uh, you push me. <laughs> My brother once um, was riding on a camel and it pissed down his leg. Excellent. I just saw it. This is the same brother. This is the same brother that bought you your copy of Bleach. Yes, it was. Wow. Yeah. So well, that's relevant then. Ex- that's, fine. that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah it's, it's all part of the story. Tenuous link right there. Um, so, Nick, I think Love Buzz, um, but I. Going back to um, uh, sort of your um, explanations about negative creep, I think school yeah. is also they are so simple the songs. Aren't yeah, they? yeah. Like, they, there is an amazing sort of simplicity to them, and you kind of you know when you hear a really great song for the first time, and I always because we both try and write songs. <laughs> yeah, that, that one especially, but when you when you hear a really great song, you think like, shit, how did no one come up with that riff before? Like someone must have done because I that's did. such a great yeah <laughs> you did that's such a great riff but like with um, Bleach there's so many tracks on there where they're kind of really simple riffs yeah. but they sound absolutely amazing yeah and you got to remember the time that it was recorded as well yeah uh, if if it came out today I think it would yeah, be bloody brilliant still it, actually I think it still sounds probably the most kind of um, relevant not that obviously Nevermind is awesome but some of the productions has a little bit sort of um, Little shit. Cynthia, yeah, a little bit yeah, shit yeah. Some the production. On yeah. It. Um, again, that was the time, wasn't it, as well? Um, yeah, yeah, it was just the style. And, you know, I think the production they ended up with on Nevermind wasn't perhaps to the band's taste, but it was better than the production they had initially. So, But this is because it was done on a budget and done really quickly. I think they just bashed it out in five hours or something yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, um, exactly. Well, if it's recorded for $600, they probably didn't have much more time. So it all sounds, it's played live, it sounds really great. And then, yeah. Okay, well, Nirvana, never heard from them again after that. Uh, that was it. Or, or was there a second record? No, nah, it wasn't. No, okay. Well, um, while we work out if there was a second record or not, uh, you can listen to this. Some people, they don't understand That they need to be musically educated That's why Matt and Guy are here How to listen to Right, we're back. This is How to Listen To, and today we're covering Nirvana. Now, do you just want to clarify first, Matt, for anyone out there who is uh, maybe unsure which Nirvana we're talking about? I, yes, I, I do. There, There is, in fact, um, a couple or a few bands called Nirvana, or have been in the There's, past. There's um, Nirvana. Nirvana and N- Nirvana. <laughs> yes, my favourite of the lot was Nirvana. <laughs> um, but there's one from the 60s, a British band. Yes, British, and I think they were... Rock, yeah. maybe. Um, I'm sure they're marvellous. Yes, I'm sure, and credit to you people. There's um, a Christian rock band called Nirvana, who um, I assume were American. Um, <laughs> and you say there's a... Where's the other one from? Um, Sweden. Oh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Nirvana didn't break up after Bleach came out. In fact, they got a lot of attention, and a lot of major labels apparently tried to sign them. But it was um, David Geffen's label, DGC, that, that, that got them. Uh, that signed them and uh, yeah I don't know how that was how people reacted at the time obviously they weren't particularly well known but they you get the feeling they were in quite a big uh, like local music scene or a music scene in the States with a lot of other alternative indie bands yeah and uh, but I think that Nirvana and well particularly Nirvana didn't like that they, they liked the fact there's other bands around um, and because it was Seattle um from what I understand, is that Seattle's quite um, away from from anywhere else in terms of bus routes and um, and 
transport links in yeah, in it's quite remote. Uh, remote is the word I'm looking for. Wow. I've never used to be very good at geography yeah. and stuff like that. Um, Does it have any oxbow lakes? <laughs> oxbow lakes, I know. Also, uh, also litter on the beach. That's what I did my GCSE coursework on. Um, anyway, um, and what. Um, what happened was you've got me off track now is that most of the the bands who were touring like um i don't know kiss <laughs> <laughs> oh well, like the big the big the big bands, bands of the day um didn't go to seattle because right. it was a bit too much of an effort to get yeah. there so therefore they had their own little um okay, music little scene bubbles, so they had pearl jam and soundgarden came out of seattle and other people uh pixies i think was seattle yeah well you certainly get that sense from i saw the Nick Broomfield documentary Kurt and Courtney which isn't great um, I saw that and was very disappointed yeah um, in Kurt and Courtney <laughs> yeah it's it's not great but it is um, interesting in that it, it kind of it meets uh, Nick Broomfield goes and meets people who knew Kurt and obviously Courtney and it does feel like Lovely there was people. a sort of uh, sort of yeah like a little uh, little bubble there mm. where if you were into this band or that band but they were all sort of semi-local and like the Melvins and the Pixies yep. and all these sorts of yeah. bands um, but Nirvana were kind of one, obviously, not the only one, obviously, but one that got kind of signed up to a massive label. And what does it be like two years, two, three years later, 1991, they come out with uh, Nevermind, mm. which I guess most people either have heard or have got. Um, I said earlier that I got into Nirvana really through MTV. And it's, it's hard. I don't know if MTV is even still on now to put it. Do you have MTV? There are music channels on TV. There are. <laughs> there, there are. Yeah. And, but I think MTV now just plays reality. I'm a teenager. This is my baby. Oh, kind really? of documentaries and wow. Keanu, Keanu, Keanu West. What's he called? Keanu West. <laughs> I know my... He was in the Matrix, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Keanu West. Yeah, it's... Oh, right. So it's um, not... Because when I was a kid, it was just music video, music video, yeah. music video. Then MTV News. Oh, yes. Uh, and then music video. Sometimes um, Yo! MTV Raps and... Uh, Headbangers Ball. Hey, yes. Yeah, I used to like all that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, MTV was massive. And I used to watch it all the time. And Smells Like Teen Spirit was on it sort of non-stop. And it just became this huge sort of anthem. And it really launched the record uh, to just be one of the biggest records and one of the biggest selling records of all time. Mm. It certainly did. So it's coming out in 1991. Um, it's, coming. it's coming out. Yeah. <laughs> we've gone. We've gone back in time. Yeah, uh, I, I'm just. I'm just recapping. Um, <laughs> Nevermind was released 24th of September '91, the same day as Blood Sugar Sex Magic by the Red Hot Chili Peppers, which isn't a record I listen to now. But when I was oh. a kid, I really liked that record. I the, thought it was awesome. That is some some record. It is. It's what what a day. For what, a, what a day. <laughs> what a day. For That's like Christmas. What what day was it again? It was the 24th of September 1991. Oh, sort of. Well, in, in England, people became back to school. Yeah. After summer. Che- cheer up, son. It's not so bad going back to school. Listen to this Nevada. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's exactly. a spring in your step. Exactly. Um, but just to give you some context, because I'm all about the context. I like context. 1991. Uh, bit, of a, bit of a mixed bag, musically. You've got the first Smashing Pumpkins record coming mm-hmm. out. Again, probably from Seattle, I think. Why not? Why not? Yeah, um, we're not even <laughs> doing yeah. anything about They're American. Yeah. They play Probably guitars. Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. Uh, Metallica, the Black Album came out. Not from Seattle. Good. Pearl Jam, 10. That's a good record. From Seattle. Had that on tape. That, yeah, very good. You had it from tape? I had it on tape. Oh. Yeah. My brother bought it for me. Actually, not dissimilarly to your story about your brother buying you bleach. My brother bought it for me on my command. Said, my command. <laughs> I demand you <laughs> buy. Said that he thought... Basically, everything I listened to was shit, and then he started stealing it, borrowing it, and then just never gave it back. But your brother used to, or still does, have a Guns N' Roses tattoo? He does. Yeah. yeah I, I believe he has the big Guns N' Roses tattoo across his shoulders. So, um, yeah. So, you know. So, he knows music. He knows music. Primal Scream, Scream Delica came out that year. Amazing <laughs> album. Massive Attack, Blue Lines. U2, Acton Baby. Uh Less you sort of skipped over that one quite yeah, quickly. Not a big U two fan. No. Less joyously, um, Freddie Mercury died in nineteen ninety one, uh, and um, that Brian Adams was at number one for sixteen weeks with um, a song. I don't actually know what the title. <laughs> uh, Everything I do, I do it for you. Is it something like that? Or? Was that the title? 
I just, I, I, I just used to call it the Robin Hood song. Yeah, the Robin Hood song. Um, We've not Robin Hood. <laughs> Robin Hood. <laughs> Riding through the glen. Um, what was it? Look into my eyes. Mm, that one. And you will find. I don't actually know what that's called. Mm, if only it had been number one for longer, I might have learned. Do, 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 that's beautiful. Do, 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 yeah, so it was, it was a busy time musically. <laughs> that's having a moment. Yeah, I, I was just explaining to you before we started recording when that came on. Um, I used to have that song on repeat probably about as long as it was on number one. Um, yeah, just 16 minutes. Playing books. Lego um, Robin Hood because um, they had little Lego Robin yeah. Hoods at that time. Um, that was fun. Well, I'll tell you what, I think if you ever want to understand a kid's uh, mixed music tastes, like mm-hmm. I, I'd say I have an eclectic taste now, but most of it is sort of guitar sort of stuff. I bought, never mind, probably 91, 92, but I also bought the Brian Adams single. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know. You're cool. I'm, I'm cool. I, I obviously bought it as well. Who did, everyone is Actually, I, I think I probably half bought it. Yeah. Because, again, sort of money issues. Money issues, yeah. The money issues. And money's too tight to mention. Might, um, might write a rap song about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about Smells Like Teen Spirit. <laughs> Um, in a bit more detail. Uh, the first, the first um, big noticeable thing: no Chad Channing on drums. Yes, they're getting a new guy. Who, who's that? I can't remember his name. Dave he, Grohl. He didn't go on to do anything. Dave Grohl. Yeah, whatever happened to him, eh? So uh, the video for um, "Smells Like Teen Spirit" was kind of visually quite striking, and I guess for a lot of people, introduced them to Kurt Cobain, this good-looking blonde guy with like a flannel shirt on and torn jeans and all that sort of stuff. And that was the sort of the image that everyone had for like the next yeah. five, ten years. You still see kids today dressed like that. And that's why it's so powerful is the fact that in, in that video is it looks like he and the band, but particularly him, is rebelling against school um, and quite a lot of that, that yeah. stuff that teenagers have to go through. And perhaps I try still try and hold on to to be young again. Yeah. No, I think I think there's an element of that. If, um, if you want to know more about this, a lot of the information we've got today has come from an amazing website called nirvanaclub.com, which is the internet Nirvana fan club. And there's amazing stuff on there. And one of the things I saw on there, Matt, was um, a little uh, clipping, a press clipping, which um, is like an advert that Nirvana put out saying, do you want to come and be in a music video? We're looking for mm. people who are going to look like, you know, high school um, stereotypes. We want cheerleaders and goths or whatever. Yeah. And it's just a tiny little clipping. That I, I don't know where it appeared. And um, and then it goes on to create this amazingly iconic video, which, again, apparently Kurt Cobain wasn't that keen on the video. It didn't do quite what he wanted. But, yeah, it's amazing to think that a load of kids probably turned up just thought, oh, this would be fun being a band, yeah. band's video that I've never heard of. And it goes on to be something that, you know, goodness knows how many times it's been played. So, yeah, it comes out. It's uh, it's huge. Um, <laughs> That's a technical term. Yeah, it's a technical term. <laughs> And Kurt Cobain becomes this iconic figure, gets called the voice of a generation and sort of like the, the kind of the leader of generation. I think he really liked that as well. Yeah, he, he loved he, it. He liked the pressure that, that he loved, that put he on loved him. That's what he was in it for. So it was like the perfect combination, really, for, I guess, the record label at the time because it was critical acclaim. He was really cool and authentic, credible, um, and loads and loads of record sales. Which is probably what the record did. They like that most. But they they, yeah. they love that. Of all the things we like about yeah. Um So they hoped, um, I read that Geffen hoped they would sell uh, 250,000 copies uh, of, um, of Nevermind. Um, they just beat that by selling 30 million. That, oh, slim margins. Yeah, slim so margins. they hit their targets. And they were selling 400,000 copies a week at one point in the States. And Smells Like Teen Spirit sold 8 million singles. Those numbers eight are, million. That's ridiculous. Do those numbers? Does anyone hit those sorts? Those of numbers? numbers don't even exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, who's really big? Like that, these days, it would be like Beyonce or uh, Kanye West. Like, they don't sell those sorts of record numbers. I was going to say the Bee Gees. <laughs> the Bee Gees. They're massive. Yeah. yeah. Have you heard of them? Yeah. yeah. But they don't sell those sorts of numbers anymore, do they? Like the, I thought that's why everyone now makes all their money through touring and things yeah. because you can't that's sell. Cool. 30 million. I don't know, maybe Adele does. It must, it must be easier to download stuff than actually going out and buying something from a record store. Yeah. So therefore, you'd probably have to... It, the download should be more, right? But I don't think people do that. I think they just stream it or watch it on YouTube or, you know, yeah. use their computer. Um, sorry oh, to dazzle works. you with technical, <laughs> yeah. technical details. 
but yeah, that is insane, isn't it? 30 million copies. And let's talk about it as a record. Like, hmm. It's got an incredibly iconic cover of a little boy. Um, the first thing when we looked at it this morning, you said he's got a big cock. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yeah, yes. um, he's, um, he's a very well-endowed boy, but we're not going to be talking about babies' penises on this no, podcast. It is, it is an amazing record. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, that's right around the podcast. Yeah. Um, it's an amazing record. It obviously starts with Smells Like Teen Spirit, but there's like a number of really standout hard rock, but really melodic melodic yep tracks on there and it was a real crossover record wasn't it and something mm. one of the only interesting things in that nick broomfield documentary was that he said um the kurt cobain apparently hated the fact that uh, people kind of driving bmws were uh, listening to yeah. his music that sort of really went against everything yeah. he he wanted to be about but um you know i think if you get if you write a record like this and it becomes that big you lose control of it yeah, and I, I know that um, Kurt especially was was worried that when they signed um, for the major label that they were selling out and that yeah. wasn't what they were about. And I think that was the major um, issues that he had with not just Nevermind, but the career after Nevermind as well. You've been listening to Nevermind lately? I have, yeah. You know, it's a record I never I ever put on because I feel like I know it so well that it just doesn't interest me but I've listened to it for this show and again it, it's just amazing it's such a good record it's it is so intelligent it's musically intelligent he, that that man yeah, that, 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 I, I missed that <laughs> that, that <laughs> just goes straight over my head <laughs> I just like the tunes um, and it makes sense as well with you got the, the really amazing start and then it gets a bit more melodic within bloom and come as you are then it go, goes up a little bit of a, a gear with breed and then lithium lithium was another really big hit yeah yep. i remember it being one when i was at school that people really liked and uh, it's the lyrics are quite provocative one of my favorite songs on its lounge act i just think yeah. it's great drain you is great as well actually but, the second the second half of the album is probably the some of the kind of not quite well as known songs but uh absolutely amazing they're really, and they, really really good and they there if you look on youtube um there's some amazing live versions of of those yeah. songs and they seem to play them quite a lot and not take the piss when they're playing them as well yeah where, like, smells like teen spirit yeah you know, turning up on was it that one they played on top of the top pops of the pops. with um, kurt cobain wearing boxing gloves oh it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't boxing gloves on top of the pop it might be in one the one that yeah. i saw it was just him taking the piss not not um, touching his they've been, asked to, they've been asked to mind yeah. yeah and being a Jesus sort of yeah. his arms out and um, with a silly voice as well yeah very, very deep voice <laughs> um, but that takes balls because I, I remember um, did I watch it at the time I don't know perhaps not but it was about the same time as I started watching Top of the Pops but I certainly saw it before sort of around the same time as I bought Bleach and I just remember thinking that Top of the Pops is the biggest thing in the world, and that takes massive balls yeah, to, well, it felt to like go. The biggest thing in the world, yeah, it, it? it was to me. Yeah. It was whatever on a Thursday night. It used Seven o'clock, be. BBC One. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a like, British Institute, and there's these three um, American uh, chaps who are sort of taking the piss, but quite rightly so as well, if they've been asked to mime. Yeah, but that would have gone over my head at the time. Yeah, I wouldn't have understood that at all. I'd have thought, wow, that guy, he's good, he can play a guitar with boxing gloves. Yeah. <laughs> he really is the real deal. Um, okay, well, I think that kind of covers Nevermind. It's an amazing record, isn't it? And it's one that, you know, I guess it's probably one of these records that still sells absolutely tons and will continue to. It's often listed in the um, in the big sort of um, greatest albums of all time. Sort mm -hmm. of list. I'm not sure if I'm quite there with it on, um, on Nevermind, but it's a really, really great record. I just like the little monkey on the back of it with the bomb. <laughs> I've never actually listened yeah. to it. I just like the monkey. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's a great record, and um, that that's that's huge. They tour tons. Um, as I say, Kurt Cobain becomes this massive iconic figure, um, and he starts dating uh, a, a, a a woman called a lady woman, a lady woman called Courtney Love, who again Nick Broomfield documentary doesn't show her in a particularly good light. She no. just comes across as a pretty manipulative lady yeah. uh, but you know he was presumably happy with her he, he had a kid he seemed to be he yeah you know talked about love quite a bit in some of the interviews yeah. i saw yeah so you know we're not uh that's 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 not our concern Matt. no but uh yeah that you can't really imagine can you being in their situation of being one minute you're 
a small band scratching around for you know money and then you sell 30 million copies of an album and mm. everyone in the world thinks you're amazing and the voice of a generation and you're battling with horrible depression yeah. um, and some drug issues and crippling stomach <laughs> pains um, which you've had forever and you came we're talking about Kurt Cobain here from a pretty upset family life it was a bit fucked up yeah yeah um, so we haven't really touched on that yet and uh, obviously it's very difficult because you read a lot of accounts you can't ask the the man himself but it seems like he had a pretty unhappy childhood and um, yeah I don't think the huge success really helped his sort of state of mind I don't think he was perhaps ready for it or wanted it and was prepared for it but no. I wouldn't know because I'm not him no well that's, <laughs> thanks for clarifying that yeah um, just to clarify that yeah well before we find out what uh, what happened next with Nirvana and uh, give you some some of our thoughts and anecdotes and, and some fascinating facts <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll just do this. You're listening to How to Listen To. Well done. Okay, we're back. I am Guy. And I'm Matt. And this is How to Listen To. Today we're dealing with Nirvana. Dealing with them. That sounds very aggressive, doesn't it? We're you are, you about, are aggressive. We're, we're talking about Nirvana. Stop it! Ow! <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've talked about Nirvana, who are an amazing, amazing band. And uh, we've gone through Bleach and we talked about uh, never mind. We're going to talk now about uh, In Utro, uh, which was their third and final um, studio, studio album. Studio album. Um, now, coming back to what we were just saying, all the crazy stuff the band went through and, and the, uh, the, uh, le- the lead singer and main guy, Kurt Cobain, went through, um, this leads us into In Utro. Mm, Tell does. us a bit about that. In Utro um, was recorded, I, I think... Um, Kurt and the band um, were very um, surprised, shocked, but didn't like the fact that um, Nevermind was so big and wanted to write a go back to more of a um, less of a mainstream sound. Like just a hard rock record. Hard rock record is, 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 is exactly it. So they, they, they recorded um, In Neutro, which comes across a little bit more heavier. Yep. Perhaps a little bit more sad, depressed, maybe. Although that they, um, it's quite cynical. In places yeah, as cynical. Well. Yes, yeah. Particularly sort of if you look at the um, heart shaped box video that goes with. Yeah, uh, and, and <laughs> the first track, "Serve the Servants." Um, uh-huh. The first line of the album is "Teenage angst has paid off well. Now I'm bored and old," and you kind of, um, you, you, that does kind of pervade the record. Now I said to you before we started, like. Nevermind um, was obviously this huge record. In Utro was one that I always really liked, but I never really felt like I kind of connected with it, not to sound too sort of airy-fairy. Mm-hmm. But um, I listen to it again now. There's some great songs on it, but I kind of can't get in really into it. I don't really connect to it in a way. And I find it is quite sort of um, hard, hard to, uh, to, to get into. It doesn't hang together quite as well for me as either Bleach or, or Nevermind. Um, yeah, I think you're right there in, in terms of, we talked about perhaps them... Um, Never mind being a little bit more of a story, um, perhaps bleach as well to some extent, um, but it I don't think it flows as much as but you'd want it to. There are some... That's classic. A classic <laughs> tracks on it. It's still a really, really good record. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's some absolutely awesome stuff on there. I'm just looking at it now. Um, if you just want pure sort of rock things like very ape is absolutely awesome it's one of my favorite nirvana tracks yeah santa's apprentice is absolutely awesome did you know about that tell me um apparently dave Grohl was doing the drumming which is probably very iconic because that's how it starts and it's probably the main part and parcel of the um of the track but apparently kirk Cobain wasn't particularly happy with the whole song didn't yeah. like it but was too not too afraid but didn't want to um, upset Dave Grohl, so yeah. he just sort of went along with it, and they put it on the album, even though he didn't. He wasn't a fan of it. He, I don't, from from what I've been told, don't quote me on it, but that's what I've I've been told by a source. A source, <laughs> an unnamed source. <laughs> unnamed source. This is like a tabloid. Um, <laughs> touching on the cynicism, obviously one of the tracks, track number ten, a good track, radio friendly unit shifter, mm-hmm. which is anything but. And Tourette's, you know, they're quite. There's a lot of aggression on here. Yep. Yeah. There were reports pre-release because you got to remember. When people were waiting for Nevermind, well, they weren't really, not in any no. huge numbers. Um, but by the time we're waiting for a neutro, they're pretty much the biggest band in the world. 
Mm. Um, and there's a huge amount of hype in the press, as I said earlier. Kurt is now not only this iconic figure, but he's in the tabloids because of Courtney Love and this sort of real rock and roll lifestyle um, he seemed to be uh, living. But there were reports pre-release that the record was, uh, quote, unreleasable. The, mm. um, you know, the mm. as you kind of alluded to off air, that they were deliberately making a difficult record. Yeah. Do you think there's anything in that? I, I do. I'm, I mean, I've gone through quite a lot of interviews um, recently building up to this um, uh, this show. And um, the more and more you listen to what the band was saying, and not just um, Mr. Cobain, um, but um, Dave Grohl as well. And that, that's the interesting dynamic of the band is that there's three people that could answer a question uh, in an interview, and yeah. they would. And you'd see um, Kurt Cobain slowly, slowly withdrawing from most interviews that I saw. Yeah, it's not a um, sting in the police situation, is it? No, no, it's, exactly, um... yeah. Me, me, me. <laughs> 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 what was that? That was a bee. Oh, <laughs> I was going to sting you, but... Yeah, yeah very good. Yeah, that's good, eh? <laughs> that's, that's how I work. Um, <laughs> I don't know where I was. Where was I? You were saying about how, I think, the public perception was perhaps of it being Kurt Cobain and these two other guys, but in reality, when you see interviews with them yeah, as yeah. a band, they're a tight three-piece band of guys that seem to get on pretty well together. Yeah, and Kurt would, would talk about um, them they're having a very strong relationship and obviously that they'd get annoyed with each other but they'd yeah. have this passive aggressiveness that they'd just sort of bear with each other and they'd just go through it rather than have a storming yeah. argument and things and which probably all... comes out very well in the music particularly in Neutro I would have thought because it is sort of all it's quite an angry record angry yeah but Dave Grohl does come across as the nicest man in the world doesn't uh, he? he probably is the nicest he's man he's just like the, the world. coolest guy like can you there's a, the video. nice meter and he's like he's beyond right it. it he's beyond it I think I saw this video on YouTube where for some reason he was showing a report around his house and he walked through his kid's nursery and I thought imagine having Dave Grohl as a dad like that wins the cool dad stakes doesn't it yeah if you're at the school gates oh uh, this my is dad the... works in insurance yeah <laughs> what no offence dad, dad <laughs> oh, oh my dad was the drummer in Nirvana <laughs> the guy that does the Foo Fighters yeah. like yeah 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 nice one dad yeah, exactly <laughs> no hope for dads yeah but yeah, the, the big single off in Neutro is obviously Heart Shaped Box, which is just a huge sort of iconic record, and as you say, really controversial video. They were kind of at a point where they could get away with anything. And yeah. They did a very sort of um, uh, iconic, controversial video full of religious imagery and... Little Ku Klux Klan Yeah, and there's kind of all the kind of... There's a lot of art related to kind of babies and fetuses and uh, yeah. things like that. Kurt loved to. He loved do, a fetus. He, he does. He did love a fetus, but he also loved to to create art. Um, um, and you can obviously see yeah. that in the um, in Neutro. And I'm guessing the cover stuff. of um, Incesticide, the sort of the record that was put out in between uh, Nevermind and Neutro by by the label, is again a, a self portrait or some sort of um, painting. It's kind of a, a quite disturbing painting on the on the front cover of that. Um, yeah, of skeleton. a very very skinny skeletal man, and he had a big issue with his, um, with weight, his weight. Yeah, he, he really hated um, being so skinny and wanted to be kind of a bigger or seem like a, a bigger guy than he than he was. Um, Hence the baggy clothes, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So we we're going to cover obviously mainly just these these studio records, but there are a couple of other records that are really really worth listening to, and obviously um, inevitably, if not slightly sadly, after uh, Kurt Cobain ended his life the year after. In Neutro came out, there was a lot of records coming out and um, mm -hmm. a lot of retrospectives and all this sort of stuff. And they remain a really massive band, Nirvana. And you've had, um, you know, just thinking you've had a, a, a best of that uh, we looked at the two, track listing of. 2002. We didn't agree with it. We didn't agree with the track <laughs> listing at all. But Unplugged in New York, which I believe sold 25 million copies Did in it? itself. God. Which is an that's, insane, it's a really, really good record. And that came out seven months after he died, I think. Is that right? Yeah, sort of just at the end of... It's kind of heartbreaking because you watch that show and listen to it and he's in a really sort of light-hearted... Yeah. He seems really happy. Sort of jokes. Yeah. Sort of says, says things that perhaps aren't that funny but because he's Kurt Cobain. Yeah, there's a lot of sycophants <laughs> in the <audience>. <laughs> 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 he said something about tuning a harp, which yes. really, really and funny. He's only got two cups of tea. <laughs> yeah. Oh. But yeah, he just or seems like a normal a harp. He seems like a, a normal guy, and obviously he's a normal guy. But I think 
we're all guilty of when someone's this huge iconic figure of thinking, well, you know, they're not they're not actual humans. They don't do actual yeah. things. And he's there. He's just relaxing. He's chatting. And the interesting thing about that record is he does uh, what I'd like to call a Bob Dylan on Unplugged in New York. Um, you, like, you like Dylan? I do love Dylan. Um, in that they turned up and they decided to play none of their hits. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which Nirvana must have been delighted, which uh, yeah. MTV must have been delighted with. Exactly. When are you doing Smells Like Teen Spirit? Nope. Yeah. Lithium? No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Heart Shaped uh, Box? Nine. <laughs> um, but they run through some amazing covers that we talked about earlier. Yeah. The Bowie one is fantastic, mm-hmm. man. He sold the world. Yeah. Um, I refer to that as a Dylan because Dylan famously turned up at Unplugged and uh, said, yeah, I'm happy to play Unplugged, but I do want to play it electric. <laughs> and he said, are you aware of what Unplugged mm-hmm. means? But he's, I'm not doing that. Sounds like it's from The Simpsons. Yeah, and it, it was absolutely amazing, amazing record. But yeah, so that's another, that's a really, really worth checking out, that um, that record. It's um, really good, really good. There's from the muddy banks of the uh, Wish Car, Wish which Car, is a kind yeah. of real, a good hard rock live rock record yeah which I, I don't know how well that's sold um i i don't know either but it's one i think we all bought but i've never listened to it that much i've listened to it quite a lot recently just to 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 get myself back into um nirvana um, yeah and it is i would have liked to see them live that's what yeah. i would say can you imagine <laughs> yeah it would have been pretty bloody brilliant i think it would have been a band that you get a different show every single night it's um they just when you see clips of them live, sometimes Kurt is absolutely on it, and sometimes it's pretty shambolic, and that's kind of what makes live music exciting when you have those sorts of performers yeah. that can really turn it on. And also, Dave Grohl's drums like that is the. If I had one sort of memory of listening to Nirvana that came flooding back was when I listened to Nevermind, and when the drums come in on Smells Like Teen Spirit, they are so loud and so high in the mix they just absolutely blow you away mm. and I think that would have been amazing amazing to see right now is time for a segment of the show that I'm sure will become much beloved <laughs> which is I know why I'm laughing fascinating facts hmm fascinating, fascinating facts. facts right we're going to round up today with some fascinating facts about the band in question Nirvana Matt do you want to hit me with a fascinating fact I I could start off. Are we going to alternate? Why not? You can yeah. quiz me if you like. I'll quiz you. I, I I had that question, didn't I? I can't remember what it was. Oh, it'll come to me. Okay, here's here's a question. Here's one for you. Nirvana fan. In 1992, yep. Nirvana, never mind, knocked someone off the top spot of the album charts. Who was it? <laughs> it was. Michael Jackson. It was Michael Jackson. You're dangerous. Exactly. See, it doesn't matter if you're black or white, I still know the answer. Exactly. Just imagine that. You, you know you made it when you've knocked bloody white. <laughs> the yeah. king of pop off the yeah. top. Yeah, the king is dead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Literally. See, see you later, Jacko. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's yours. What was uh, Kirk Cobain's middle name? I know that. And I wish it was his first name. What is it? Donald. Yeah. Donald Cobain would have been. It was, it was, that is rock and roll right yeah. there. What did Kurt Cobain dye his hair with sometimes? I don't know. Hair dye? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Correct! Back of the net. Strawberry Kool Aid. Right? Yeah, apparently. Well, I read it, I read it there, where somewhere. And why on earth not? Okay, which, uh, which band, 1991, when Nevermind comes out? Which band launched a 26-month world tour? 26 month? Yeah. That's a long time. Some crazy... In in 91? Yeah. Ooh. They must be quite big. I'll give you a clue. Kirk Cobain really hated them. <laughs> Not Morrissey. No. <laughs> well... Uh, <laughs> Guns N' Roses. It was Guns N' Roses. 20... 26-month world tour. Use your illusion tour. Um, yeah, I suppose they did have two two albums. records to tour, yeah. But yeah. they were the sort of um, antithesis of what uh, Kurt Cobain wanted Nirvana to be about, wasn't it? And um, we we uh, have seen some uh, interview transcripts where he basically describes them as total crap. <laughs> yeah. um, and you know, I I, I like I like uh, Guns N' Roses. Okay, they they're pretty good. They're pretty rocking. But um, they were the antithesis of what um, Nirvana wanted to be about. They saw them as a big sort of I don't know stupid stadium rock sort of act, didn't they? Like, mm borderline hair metal sort of thing and they wanted yeah. to be legitimate playing 
clubs playing hard rock you know, grunge records. We haven't used the word grunge today. That's amazing, isn't it? I have... Uh, as, a, as a true Nirvana fan, I have used it, um, be, not used it, um, because they didn't like it. They didn't like it? Yeah. Yeah. They hated it. Yeah, I don't really... They, did, they didn't like labels. They don't like labels. Yeah, no. labels. Um, Labelless and lonely. Labelless and lonely. That's a good one. that one down. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to find out more about Nirvana, which uh, hopefully today has given you some information and a lot of crap, um, there's a... There's, a really good book, uh, I'm told, called Heavier Than Heaven, the biography of Kurt Cobain by Charles R. Cross. Mm. Um, if you want a bit of a broader understanding, though, an understanding of the band and the history of the band rather than just Kurt Cobain, it is easy to get sidetracked onto just Kurt Cobain. As I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, nirvanaclub.com is friggin' awesome for uh, a source of facts. Mm. I've got a really good fact, and it is from that book. Because you know um, when they were, they were big... Um, when they were big, remember that? Mm, um, after um, Nevermind, they um, headlined on Saturday Night Live, which was the biggest bloody show in America. Yeah. Um, and they were the biggest band. They've just knocked um, MJ off the top spot. Ow! Dangerous! Yeah. Um, and uh, so, um, so putting that in 1991, two years before that, yeah. Kurt Cobain went to a... Um, a job interview for, um, for um, cleaning out dog kennels. Wow. I and guess he didn't get the job. He hence, didn't get the job. Hence why he started Nirvana. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, yeah, that, that kind of puts it in context, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? I read that he, he was a, a lifeguard or a swimming pool attendant at one point. That was me, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's true, actually. Um, he Although was I did. just following his footsteps. He probably, I, did, I was actually, I didn't, yeah. didn't even know that. Uh, I guess we, I'm, gonna, I'm cutting back into fascinating facts now. Did you know... Oh, wasn't that a fascinating fact? If Kurt was still alive today... Gosh. What? He'd be... 49 years old. Oh, I thought he'd be older. You know, I don't think... This is something I should have touched on earlier. I don't think there would have been another Nirvana record after a new true, even if Kurt hadn't died and tragically. I think he'd had enough. I think he was always going to die, to be honest. There was a horrible I'm, inevitability. I'm not laughing about, yeah, about it. it. It's a sad but... sort of trajectory, wasn't it? I think when you take a step back and time allows you to do that you can kind of see it mm. coming. Uh, that sounds probably a bit crude. But... Well, he, he had tried to commit suicide like six times or something. That, yeah. That's spring. That's not good. Yeah. 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 Okay, so if you want to get in touch with the show, there's a number of ways to do it. You can go to Facebook and check out our How To Listen To page there. You can contact us on Twitter, at How To Listen To, mm. or you can send us an email, which is how to listen to at gmail.com. Gmail. Gmail. Send us uh, episode requests. Send us uh, money. Love uh, letters. Love letters. Love letters. Um, and send us anything, really. Um, mainly praise. We're very thin-skinned. Um, and obviously, mm. if you like us, please we do, do like rate praise. and review us on iTunes and wherever you get your, ever get your podcast. Tell your friends. Uh, we'll be back next time. <laughs> Uh, and Matt, do you want to tell us who we're going to learn how to listen to next time? We're going to learn to listen to the big man himself. Jesus. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jackson. Wow. Well, that's that a big owl? one. Yeah, that's owl. a big one. That's an owl. Okay, so we'll be back soon. We hope you enjoyed uh, how to listen to. It's goodbye from me, Guy. It's goodbye from me, Matt. And we're going to finish off uh, with a fantastic cover of Heart Shaped Box by someone called Kawehi. Um, you find him on YouTube at I am Kawehi, and uh, we'll see you next time. Ta ta. Ah.